All right, can you see the screen? Yes. All right, very good. Thank you for the introduction, Ozni. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, everyone. I believe uh, that there are opportunities as we go along for you to uh, ask questions. We'll pause momentarily, so if you have uh, questions, um, you may ask, I think, either in the chat uh, or, or verbally. Is that correct, Ozni? That's correct, Mike. And the, uh, in the chat, there is a link to the uh, Google Doc where questions can be submitted or, as you said, questions can, can be submitted through the chat as well. All right, very good, thank you. All right, uh, so I, I chose this title purposefully, the barely sufficient uh, part, uh, you know, based on uh, some life experiences I've had over the past uh, almost three decades in scientific software. I'll explain that as we go. Um, so first, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the Exascale Computing Project for the funding of uh, the IDEAS effort, and also to Sandia, uh, who employs me. Uh, so a bit of an outline, I want to describe my perspective, uh, 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 just so you get a sense of where I'm coming from. I want to talk a bit about Barely Sufficient. Then I'm going to talk about small team models and challenges, agile workflow management for small teams. I will address larger teams, too. Uh, a bit, but not a primary focus. And then throughout, I'm going to be using an example to hopefully drive and make, you know, concrete some of the uh, ideas that I'm describing. Okay, so what is my perspective on this? Um, I do not consider myself an expert in software engineering and software project management. I consider myself more like the psychologist uh, who, you know, grew up in a you know, somewhat functional, somewhat dysfunctional family and went into the career of psychology to, to help others deal with uh, both the good and bad that uh, that person experienced. And so I'm so more like a psychologist than an expert. Also, I don't consider myself a software engineer, ex, 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 engineering expert either, but more like a carpenter, like uh, someone who uh, likes to see the tools that are available to create software, you know, sustain software, and I, I'm coming to you with things that have worked for me as a carpenter, so one carpenter to another, again, rather than an expert. Uh, so that means I'm learning as I go. Um, my, I consider myself more a domain person than a software person, uh, but I have, a, have had a lot of experience, and I've been in the field long enough to see the impact of good and negative and positive, good and bad choices, even things that take a decade or more uh, to, to, to learn that something has worked out well or not. Um, I've been uh, in the, the, I've had the experience of working with formal, more heavy software methodologies. Uh, when I was at Cray, uh, we, I worked in the math uh, software research group. We produced mathematical libraries, and we were told that we were supposed to use this formal method uh, for doing our software. Um, it, it was essentially the waterfall method, and so we dutifully you know, went to the training, we picked up the thick manuals, and then we tried for a few months to do our work that way, and then when we didn't see the, the positive influence from doing things that way, we set the stuff away and set it aside and went back to doing things our old way. Uh, similarly, in the ASCII program uh, in or around 2000, in the early part, uh, we were told that we should be looking at CMMI, Capability Maturity Model, and try for level three. Um, again, uh, a very heavy approach, not at all really connected to with how we were doing our work at the time. Uh, since then, the ASC program actually has, I think, a very nice approach to doing assessments and, and guiding projects, so they've learned. But in the early days, it was very heavyweight. And, and the reason why these things failed, why these approaches failed, I think, is because they failed to step in and understand how domain scientists were writing software and trying to produce it and sustain it. And so they really failed in the first step of what they tried to promote, which is to, to elicit requirements. And so, um, in a sense, it's like the image there, which, you know, the lock with the keys locked into it is somewhat how we felt. Uh, when we were given these techniques. And so I come from that kind of experience, and I don't think my experience is unusual. I think that many people in the scientific software 
uh, field have had similar experiences where the techniques that are used in industry, used in the commercial market, they can certainly be adapted and adopted, but they have to somehow be transformed and made usable for us in, in a way that allows us to continue to make progress in our primary goal, which is to deliver science and engineering results. So an approach I prefer much more is one that's espoused by a fellow Steve McConnell. I, I've always enjoyed his work for many years now. Uh, his book, Code Complete, is a pretty old book, but it's still very useful. Um, he doesn't produce books so much in the same way as this. He hasn't come out with, say, a version three of this book, but he still produces a lot of interesting com content that I find extremely valuable. And his argument is that code is what is ultimately valuable. So we have to be able to measure anything that we do that's not related to actual coding activities in terms of the value that it produces in the code. Um, and, and so I think if we keep that kind of, of, of framework in mind as we go forward and try to improve the way we do scientific software, I think it's to our benefit. And so this notion of barely sufficient emerges from this philosophy that we, what we want to do something that's not coding but only do what is really beneficial to the code itself. So, okay, given that kind of background, I wanna talk about some very basic team management elements uh, that I have found useful in my own work, and I, I offer them to you, again, as one carpenter to another, as possibilities for you. And I'm gonna describe them in terms of a framework not as an exact methodology, because I really think that, you know, we're, we're as a community, when it comes to software engineering, we're in a discovery phase. We're still learning about how we might do it best. And, 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 and then we can move to an exploit phase, right, to a deployment phase. But it, we're still in, I think, in this discovery phase. So I'm going to talk about some things I've discovered and have found useful. In particular, checklist policies and issue tracking systems. Okay, so, so checklists, um, yeah, I think I don't need to necessarily define that. Hopefully everybody understands it's essentially a list of activities or actions, uh, and there's a little checkbox by them. I have found checklists to, to be extremely useful for things like initiation, bringing in a new team member, uh, exit, creating a checklist prior to a team member leaving, and then working through that checklist before they depart. And then in any kind of uh, large scale transition or disruptive change in a project's activity, I find these checklists very useful. Uh, policies. Um, policies are perhaps a more subtle uh, uh, um, element of a team, but I think they're very, very important. Policies are essentially value statements about how the team conducts its work, conducts its work and, and what things it finds most important. The policy itself is actually really important. It, it, it's very important, especially for on-ramping people and as a kind of touchstone for the project as you go along in your activity. It's also an incredibly valuable tool in, in bringing people together into a more uniform understanding of what the project is about. Removing uh, unstated assumptions that are di different across your team so that you actually do have a common sense, or if you don't, if it's not common, at least to understand why it's not common uh, in how the team will conduct its work. So I strongly encourage teams, uh, my teams as well, to come up with policy statements. And the effort of doing that is valuable in its own right, um, and then having them is valuable going forward. And then issue tracking systems. Um, most of you probably have an issue tracking system. Some of you may even use it on a very regular basis. And so what I'm gonna to talk to you about is, is how to use it in a way that I think is, has been really effective for me, in particular, uh, the use of what's called a Kanban board uh, for tracking work and having a meeting conversation. Okay, so let's talk a bit about small teams. So I think it's important to have a conceptual model uh, that help us label uh, entities in our ecosystem and describe relationships between those entities. And so I'm going to talk a bit about a model for small teams. So what do, what do I consider a small team interaction model? And, and, and um, the team composition has two basic kinds of persons. Uh, one is the senior staff or faculty 
They are the stable presence on the team. They're in charge of the science questions and experiments. They, they have the big picture in mind. They know the conceptual models well, right? They're, they're in charge of funding, getting funding in and managing funding um, and keeping the team together. Uh, they tend to, not always, but tend to spend less time writing code. And, and the, you know, the larger the small team gets, uh, probably the less time the, the, the senior staff spend on that. And they may, in fact, even be fuzzy on the details of what's really going on uh, in the uh, programming and execution of experiments. They look primarily at results of those experiments. The second type of person is the junior staff and, or students. Postdocs. These tend to be transient people. They actually have two focuses. Um, one is on the science results for the project, but they also have to keep in mind that they have another position that's going to, you know, come to them in the future and they need to prepare for that. And we need to acknowledge that uh, as a part of our model. Um, so these people tend to have a stage experience. One is the new phase. The middle is the experience phase where they're doing good work and really producing and contributing to the project. And then the departing stage where they're getting prepared to go somewhere else. Um, they are also tend to be learning the conceptual models that are second nature to the senior staff. And in a lot of instances, they're the people who write most of the code and really know the details. Even if they may not have the full conceptual model, they know the details of what's going on in their sphere or in their uh, of, of capabilities or, or visibility. So that, that's a small team model. The large team model, in my experience, is often composed of small teams. So you may have a large team, but it's actually a, a team of teams, if you will. And so, and so the small team model fits as, 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 a, as a way of, of you know, a partial understanding of large teams. Um, but then you have additional interaction challenges. And in my experience in particular, uh, the policy statements that I mentioned are even more important with a large team where you have more opportunity for varied perspectives and varied backgrounds that feed into this large team. And so actually really focusing and coming to understand uh, what policies you can make as a team is important. And then also regular you know, cultural exchanges are important in my experience with a large team. Okay, so what are these small team challenges? Uh, ramping up background, conceptual models, software practices, processes, and tools. These are all things that a new team member will have to learn. Uh, the other thing is that when, as they prepare for departure, um, they need to, even on almost on day one, you have to be thinking ahead to when this team member departs, what are we going to do now and throughout the entire span of time they're here to make sure that we get the most value out of their work? And also we need to manage the dual focus that this kind of person has, that they're, yes, they're attached to my project, I'm a senior person, but they also have to be looking forward to what they're going to do next. And we have to manage those kinds of, of uh, uh, the, the competing uh, interests. Okay, so just to give a kind of pictorial sense to what I'm talking about, uh, here is you know, one example of a research team member's life cycle. So we, we have the initiation phase, uh, ramp up, ongoing planning and ongoing work, and that's a long, those two phases are, are cycle, right, as we're in the middle of this uh, lifespan of this research team member. Uh, and then we, prior to departure, we set up the exit, what we need to get done before they leave, we ramp down, we depart, and then we repeat the project process. And so the, the three basic goals of the, if I under trying to understand this life cycle model is we want to ramp up new members quickly, do whatever we can to make that uh, fast and effective. And then we want disciplined activities uh, during the middle phase when they're doing work to make sure that we're on board, everyone's doing their work as well as they can, and then we want to sustain their contributions. We want to do the work that set in a way that uh, what they contribute won't get lost and that there will be enough artifacts around the work that someone else can pick it up and move on with minimum ramp up time uh, to the, you know, when the next team member comes on board. So um, new team member, 
I advise and have had a lot of success, success creating a checklist, and essentially an initiation checklist for a new team member. Um, what I have used is I have a master checklist of, of anything that I've ever put on any team member's checklist. And then in my first meeting with a new team member, I sit and look at that list of, of activities, uh, right? It could be learning the language that we're using for programming. It could be a variety of things. I'll show you a, a sample list in a moment. Uh, but this master list then is used as a set of candidate activities for the individual. And then I create that checklist as part of, and I'm going to show GitHub as, a, as part of a GitHub issue. And then that new team member has a set of activities very concretely defined with this visceral uh, positive feedback as they check items off, as they get them done, um, as, as part of their initiation into the project. And I may, we may brainstorm and find new checklist items that I've never used before, and then I put those back into the master list in addition to adding them to the new team member. Um, and then the steady contributor phase is where the team policies come into play. These are statements about how we conduct our work no matter what uh, we're doing. And, and so it's really important for them to know that. In fact, understanding the policy should be on the checklist, the initiation checklist. And then for the departing member, we create this checklist again of all the things that we want to happen uh, before this person leaves. Um, and so I just give you one example of a new team member checklist. There's a link here. Um, and uh, that you can get to uh, in terms of policies we've had I think with the with the XSDK project which is an aggregation of the math and scientific libraries within DOE it includes hyper Petsy, super LU and Trilinos and we're adding a couple more uh, we've developed a set of policies that govern what it means to be a member of the XSDK and these policies are really important uh, first of all to guide activity and also they serve as a way to determine you know, what gap lies uh, between a, a, a prospect to join the XSDK and um, what they need to get done in order to become part of the XSDK. And so these are two examples I, I think you may find edifying if you try to take on the task of creating your own team policy. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna pause here and let people Take a time, some time to actually locally on your own, um, or if you're in a say small group listening and watching, um, maybe discuss a little bit about your your policy. So I'm going to stop here for just a couple minutes and and let you do that, and then uh, we can also uh, take questions at that time, at you know right at the end of that. So let me just pause for a bit so you can talk. Okay, um, uh, Ozzy, are there any questions at this point? Or whoever is monitoring questions? No, Mike, I don't see any. Okay, all right, very good. All right, well then, um, so, so hopefully you've had a little bit of time to think about this, how, you know, what you might do yourself. Um, I'm just gonna show you an example um, of one. Whoops, hang on. Whoops, okay. Um, so, so, uh, I, I, as as Ozzy, I mentioned, may have mentioned, I, I in addition to, to being a senior scientist at Sandia, I'm also uh, part time at St. John's University in Minnesota, and so I have a, a team of students with whom I work. Uh, we have a, right now six students, and and this example, it's small text. I realize hopefully uh, you can still see see some of the items that are here, but this is the policy statement that we've created. Uh, for what I call the Collegeville Research Team. Uh, we're in Collegeville Township in rural central Minnesota. 
And, and so this is a list of, of expectations on team members, right? So, so the university has a, a policy of conduct. And so we refer to that in item one. This is we're expecting certain behaviors from you as a team member. Um, we have a policy about initiation, transition, and exit events that we will create a checklist and use that to manage those. Uh, we track all of our work in, in an issues-only repository we call Labora, just it has a name, our work basically, um, and, and then so on. You can see item four is all work notes and relative content will be kept in a repository associated with the team's uh, GitHub organization. We also expect each team member to have their own repository in the organization that contains everything that's particular to them. So hopefully you can kind of get a sense of what could go into a set of team policies in terms of, of, of uh, describing expected behavior on the team. Uh, then the second thing in, on this slide is an initiation checklist, right? And so, so again, so I sat down with this particular student, Neil Lindquist, uh, uh, one of my students right now, and we sat down and we, and we created this list of activities uh, that are expected for him to complete, not, not before he gets started in anything else, but but as part of his preparation. And so it provides a very explicit set. And you'll notice on here, a lot of it's about learning. And, and I think that's to be expected. Um, in addition, um, and particularly, a lot of it is about learning using online courses. There's a tremendous amount of very valuable online content that allows a person to ramp up quickly. Um, I, in particular, I like Udacity's courses for software development, how to use Git and GitHub, um, there's also a reasonable course on C++, and my students usually come in knowing Java, so I, so I t say, okay, redo your lab exercises from your, your uh, CS2 uh, uh, coursework, but do them in C++. And these kinds of things are what I'm putting on the list for my students as they ramp up. So hopefully this gives you some kind of sense of what to go on to an initiation checklist. Um, and then I'll just stop here and see if there are any questions or comments. If not, I'll just move on. Yes, move on, Mike. Okay, very good. All right, so let's talk then now about uh, uh, collaborative work management with Kanban. So I think most of us probably know that you know managing issues, tasks, activities is a fundamental software process. There's a, you know you have to do this in some way. Uh, you know, if you're doing something very informal, you might just, someone might tell you something, you might think of something, and you'll just remember it, or you'll write it on an office notepad. Um, if you're doing that, you could move up to something that's a little more formal. You could create a to-do.txt file on your desktop of your, of your computer. Uh, that works good, well for one person. Um, if you wanted to ramp up a little bit more, you could create an issues.txt file in the re repository of your of, of your project code and that way anybody on the project could see it and could contribute to it and then so on and so you can move from informal with less training into things that are more formal and more training i'd like to talk about uh, kanban and some web-based tools that support kanban so kanban is is probably the simplest formal methodology for managing uh issues and tasks um, the fundamental concept of Kanban is that you limit the number of things that you're doing at one time, what we call in-progress tasks. And the idea is that you want to optimize flexibility uh, versus the amount of time it takes to swap tasks in and out. We all know, I think, from our own experience that if you have too many things to do, you're actually less efficient in an aggregate sense than if you try to limit the number of things that you do. And so Kanban, the discipline of Kanban says, you're going to specify at least some, you know, with some plus or minus factor, the maximum number of things that you'll have going on at one time. And then the discipline is that you, you do not remove an item from your in progress column. We'll talk about columns momentarily. You don't remove something from that column until it's really done. So in other words, you can't swap something in uh, and, and swap something out. Uh, and, you know, because unless that, one that item that was in there was actually done and it forces you to look at okay if i'm not getting things done quickly enough what is my 
impediment? What is stopping me from getting my work done? So it really allows you to then focus on why am I not as effective as I want to be? And, and so it, it's been used in industry for, for a long time and has been now available in the, in the software field for quite a bit of time as well. I have found Kanban plus additional things, right, um, to be a really effective way to manage uh, tasks and activities. In fact, I actually use it to manage my personal life. I use a tool called Trello that has uh, platforms on all kinds of devices that are based in the back end. And so I can update or view my tasks from just about anywhere. And I, and I find it a very effective way to manage my own activities uh, as I go forward. Um, and then the board that kind of comes with Kanban is very effective for viewing and managing issues. Um, you may have heard of Scrum, and we'll talk about Scrum. Scrum is more schedule-based, and I, I personally find that it's challenging to fit a, an R&D type of, of, of project into a Scrum framework. Some people are successful with it, um, but I find that Scrum is a little bit too rigid for R&D. And you can do deadlines. That's not a problem. You can add things to Kanban. But if you're really going to do Scrum, I, I find it challenging in an R&D setting. <clears throat> so what is the basic Kanban? Well, the very basic has only three columns. Backlog, uh, which is anything that you think of. In progress, which is the things you're working on right now, and done. I like a ready column. That's my second column on the slide. Um, and that is a set of tasks from the backlog that you know well enough, that they're scoped well enough, that if you had a slot in your in-progress column, you could start them right away. So in a way, it's a kind of staging area for activities that you know how to do if you only had the time, you know, when you finish something else. So as I mentioned, Kanban rule is you can have only so many things in progress, so many items that you're actually working, so many balls that you're juggling at the same time. Um, and the limit is really based on your experience, your calibration, you know, based on, on trying it and using it and getting your own experience with it. A really key element of Kanban and the in-progress column is that you pull work. You, someone can't put something in your progress, in your in-progress column. You actually have to pull it from the backlog or from the ready column yourself. Uh, the done column is really nice too. Um, it gives you then a list of everything you've done. So you can go back to that and look at, uh, you know, if you have to report, you know, for a merit review or whatever, it gives you a nice set of everything that you've done. Um, let's see. So uh, I also like to be creative with the columns in Kanban. Um, you know, for example, I advise students or junior members in this small team model to add a column called waiting on advisor confirmation. Um, it's a kind of at least to interesting conversations. You think you're finished with a task, you move it into the advisor confirmation column, and then how long does it sit there, right? In a sense, it kind of sheds, shines a spotlight on, on uh, waiting for something. So you can actually create columns that help you see uh, where inefficiencies might lie in your workflow. I also have a column that I call tasks that I won't do. Uh, for example, I have one, an item in my task that I won't do is I won't uh, schedule a meeting that I run for more than 30 minutes unless absolutely required. Uh, so it's just a kind of policy statement and my own kind of policy statement. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's a bit about basic Kanban. Um, let's see. So, so I'll just mention again, I'm not trying to plug a particular book, but I did find uh, I find personal Kanban to be very effective as a way to manage my own activity. Um, and I read, but again, I'm not saying you have to go out and buy this book, but they did, I did find some interesting ideas in a book called Personal Kanban. Uh, so I'll just mention that. So what tools do you have? Well, you can, Kanban can be done on a wall uh, with, with sticky notes. It can be done on a whiteboard or a black, blackboard. Uh, there are many software cloud-based solutions. For those of us who are involved in the Exascale Computing Project, we have JIRA. It's ready and, and available to us to use. It is just a, a handful of, of mouse clicks to create a Kanban board in JIRA. And so uh, that's a very nice one. Trello has, has, is a very nice tool I use. Uh, GitHub Issues has something called Project. There's a Project tab if you go to any GitHub repo 
you'll see this project tab and you can create a project board and one, one way of, of organizing the project board is to make a Kanban board. And so these are all possible ways of using Kanban. Okay, so the big question is how many tasks? I, I find it's a personal question or a team question, um, but it's one you want to try to manage. Some, you know, a bit of guidance about it, I think, is that you want to use a freeway traffic analogy, I think. I find this to be useful. You know, does traffic flow best when the, when the lanes are fully packed? In other words, and, and the correlation here is, uh, are you most effective when your in-progress column has, it totally consumes your life? Or do you want to leave a little bit of slack for, you know, dynamic, you know, other activities? And so, um, and some flexibility in how you go through your tasks. So it, it gives you some freedom, if, I think, if you think about it from that kind of perspective. Um, spend time consulting the board regularly. It brings focus. It enables you to reflect and have retrospection. It allows you to use, I have a column in my personal one is quick, I call quick to do's. And I put items in there that would take up, say, no more than 10 minutes. And that way, if I have 10 minutes, I'm sitting somewhere, I can get some, one of those done. I can whittle away at that bit. Um, and then some other advice is, this is a habit. You're trying to form a habit of using Kanban and using a Kanban board either personally or as a team. And when you get out of the habit, you know, like it's a little chaotic or your team has a, has a you know, a emergency, that it needs to address, uh, and you really need to step away from Kanban, which is perfectly okay, right? It's perfectly okay if something comes up, an emergency or some re something really urgent, if you just drop Kanban for a while, okay? The question is, is if you do that every day, then you're not really using Kanban. So it has to be something that's infrequent. But yes, of course, you don't religiously follow these methodologies. You use them as tools to make yourself more effective. And so, but if you get out of the habit, start up again, right? So, so you have to then try to get back on track. Don't, don't despair on um, this is not working for me and said, say, okay, this is all part of it. This is part of building a habit. Let's start again. Um, so what's the importance of progress in progress for, for you? Well, for junior commun community members, I think one of the great things is that you, generally speaking, you have less control over your tasks. You're, those are given to you by your supervisor, the supervisor. If you use Kanban and you have an in-progress column, it protects you, right? If you have a full in-progress column, you're working on things, um, and if someone asks you to take on another task, you really do have the right and actually responsibility to say, okay, I have a full in-progress column what should I take out of here? Or is it really that important that I, you know, that I pause with my Kanban process in order to do what you're asking me to do? And it leads to really useful and fruitful conversations about prioritizing work. All right, so here's a sample uh, Kanban board. This is a project board in GitHub where I'm using this with my students here at St. John's uh, to manage the activities. You can see the five columns. Um, oh, actually, I didn't mention the in review column. I find this column to be really useful as well. So if I think I'm done with something, and, but I need someone else to take a look at it, I will move it from in progress to in review. And that allows somebody to, to, to take some time to look at it. Uh, I didn't forget about it. And so it's, I, I find that to be a very useful column. But you can see, you know, just kind of based on the items that are in here, the kinds of activities that are going on. And then what I do prior to meeting with my students, and whether we meet in person or virtually over a phone or a video conference thing, is I tell them prior to the meeting, make sure all of your issues are up to date. You know, that, that they're, the status is up to date, that so you add a comment to, to an issue so that it's up to date in terms of its description. Also make sure that it's up to date and that it's in the proper uh, com column in our Kanban board. And then our meetings are conducted by going through the Kanban board. We focus on what's in progress, then we move to what's in review. Um, we move things if necessary or proper into the right column. We look at the ready column in the backlog to see, okay, if we remove something in our in progress, uh, what's the next thing we wanna move in here? And so it very, provides a very efficient way of, of organizing our meetings. The other thing is many, I do, and probably many of you, have multiple projects that you work on or multiple uh, issue databases that you work with 
you know, if you're on a larger project. If you organize your issues via Kanban board, you can switch from, say, a Jira database with Kanban to a GitHub uh, database with Kanban. You can switch by simply clicking on the URLs from one to the other. And so this issue of having many, you know, many, repo or many repositories and many issue databases that you have to manage is really simplified because you can simply move from one Kanban board to the next. And so I find it a very nice way. So my, I don't need to try to unify all my issues into a single Kanban board because, or a single issue database because the Kanban boards let me manage them very good, very well, sorry. Okay, let me just mention a bit about Scrum. Um, so probably many of you have heard about Scrum. I, I think by most accounts, it's by far the most popular process framework uh, used in the software industry, and I've seen it effectively used in some R&D settings as well. It, it could work for you, maybe. I'm, I don't want to dismiss it as a viability. Remember, I'm a carpenter uh, talking about tools that have worked for me and things that make sense or, or fit my sensibility. The emphasis of Scrum is really about regular sprints, reviews, retrospectives, stories, backlogs, product owners, Scrum Master, Scrum Master, and more. It's a, it's a very prescriptive model. Um, framework. And so if you're really going to do Scrum, it, it's, it's a big buy-in. And, and so what most people do that I ask, you know, if, they're, if they say they're using Scrum, is they're using what's called Scrum but. They do Scrum but. They don't do this aspect of it or they don't do it rigorously. And so my proposal is that, well, if you're going to do Scrum but, why don't you start with Kanban, which is the fundamental approach that we know works, limiting the amount of things you're, you're doing at one time, and then add elements of Scrum or other, other workflow framework, process frameworks to the Kanban approach. And I, I just tend, I don't know, so far I've found that to be a more fruitful approach rather than, than kind of you know, doing a half-baked uh, Scrum. So that, again, that's just me. And there are a couple of links here you can, you can uh, look at later if you want to. All right, so I'm going to stop for a minute and see if there are any questions or comments. Yes, Mike, we have got a bunch of questions here. Great. Uh, so let me go back. Um, okay, uh, if you are working, I'm going order here, the, 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 you know, the order I got, the, we received the question. Sure, sure. If you are working with a large team comprised of smaller teams, how do you ensure that, they, that the small teams adhere to the large team policies? How do you make sure that the small teams adhere to the large team policies? Yeah. Well, um, yeah. So, so um, it, from my experience, uh, there, are, there are a variety of uh, incentives that we tend to really pay attention to. Uh, one is money. One is, uh, you know, performance reviews or some other form of, of ranking or assessment of how you're doing your job. Uh, and then another is uh, publications and the ability to, to you know, participate in a paper, participate in a presentation. And so fundamentally, those are motivators uh, that we have as, as people, you know, who work on a project like this. Now, you, you know, there are ways to be, you know, you know heavy-handed. I, I wouldn't necessarily propose that. But you do want to look at the fundamental incentive system that your project has and see if they match the values that the project overall has. And if they don't, you need to rework the, 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 the incentive system to match your values. And so if the, if the, if the incentive system is such that people are not being you know, positively rewarded for, part, for uh, adhering to or observing large team policy statements, or, or if they're not being you know, reminded that they should, then, then you need to change the, the incentive system to match uh, the values of the project overall. And, and oftentimes, in my experience, that can happen by simply stating it. You know, simply putting in a policy in the small team uh, policy statements that says we will observe large team policies. It could be as simple as that. In my experience, the people we work with want to do the right thing. But often they haven't thought about what that is. And so you need to identify and socialize um, the, the, the policy statements and make the, uh, the incentive system match 
the values of the team overall. And it actually leads to very interesting conversation. Um, so hopefully that helps. Go ahead. Next question here, Mike. Do group members add bits to backlog with person or persons on the team that should work on it? Say that one more time. I, I tried quite caught that. So do group members add bits to backlog with person or persons on the team that should work on it? Okay, great question. So do group members add items to the backlog and then also say who should do the work? Um, that's a great question. So, so one of the challenges that we face as a community is that, you know, in our particular domain where we're producing a software is that we tend to be very specialized in what we do. And so in a, in a more commercial setting, uh, what agile methodologies would suggest is that, um, and any item that's in the backlog can probably have, you know, several team members who could take it on based on availability and other, you know, unwritten factors. Um, but in our field, we tend to have for any given task, you know, one or two people who could actually really do well with a given uh, a task that's in the uh, that's in the issue database or in our on our Kanban board, and so in that particular case, you might suggest um, who would be the right person to do it. You and and you can do that formally if you want to. Most tools actually have the ability to assign an issue to a person, and you can usually assign it to more than one. You know, so, for example, when you create an issue in GitHub. Um, all of the team members associated with that repository are potential candidates as assignees, and you can do, I think, up to 10 people. And so, so you can certainly suggest uh, who might do that, and that's, that's probably worth doing, because at the time you've written this issue, it's really, you have it fully in your mind, and it's probably worthwhile trying to associate, you know, one or a few names uh, with a given task, not in a prescriptive way, but in a suggestive way. Any more? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, Mike. Oh, sure, good. <laughs> yes. Which of these tools, Trello, et cetera, are affordable or open source? Oh, great question, yeah. So Trello for a pedestrian, it's a, I think the term is a freemium uh, package. Uh, Trello was just recently purchased by Atlassian. Atlassian produces a lot of productivity tools, including uh, Confluence and Jira, which are uh, widely used by uh, the Exascale Computing Project, um, and, uh, and you know, things like HipChat, for example, is another kind of messaging system. Um, so you can use Trello for free at the personal level. Uh, you have to, of course, be comfortable with, you know, the data that, uh, you know, they get to see your data, you know, it were in, in the you know, data access like Google, you know, anything you put in there is in a sense, you know, out there in the cloud. And so certainly they protect privacy as best we can, they can, but as we all know from, if you've been watching the news and the Equifax uh, uh, a, a mess, uh, you know, that's not a sure guarantee. So, <clears throat> so Trello is free for pedestrian use. I don't pay anything for my personal use of it. Um, I think if you try to use it as a project, you probably would get to a situation where you'd want, or you, the features you'd want, you'd have to pay for, at least a modest amount. Uh, Jira and, and other Atlassian tools are similar. Uh, um, and then uh, GitHub is, uh, is free for anything that's public and visible. Uh, I also pay, you know, like seven bucks a month for a, a private repo capabilities. Um, also, if you're in an educational setting, for example, uh, the Collegeville organization that I mentioned, my students here, I applied for and received an educational uh, license for GitHub. And so I have the ability with the, my student team, and you have to, you know, you have to be an educational organization. You have to have a .edu address. I have the ability to create unlimited private repositories uh, with GitHub. Um, and so that's fine. GitLab, I don't have much experience with myself. I've used it, but not a lot. But GitLab also has uh, free capabilities. Um, so I think any of the tools will allow you to do um, something for free uh, at a small scope, but then you'd have to pay for them or, or be comfortable with, you know, everything being public. 
Um, other people might have actually even more detailed or better information than I have on that. And if someone's saying GitLab, uh, GitLab offers unlimited private repos for free. So thank you. So Mike, Mike, we have a bunch of questions here. How do you like to proceed with the, the presentation or uh, Yeah, let me, let, me, let me go a little bit further in the presentation. And then yeah, we'll take yeah, so I, I'd like to go. I'd like to tell all participants that all these questions are going to be pasted, copied and pasted into the Google Docs, and Mike will have an opportunity to answer them in writing, right, Mike? And yeah, I will. And feel free, other people, um, other people may have questions or answers to these questions as well. I, as I said, I'm a carpenter. I'm not, I'm not an expert. So I'm trying to convey my experience and what things that work for me. I'm not omniscient. So uh, other people will have, you know, good information as well. So, so okay, let me, yes, let so me to, all, to all participants. So these questions, we'll make sure that all the questions will be answered. But Mike will just proceed with the, uh, the, the, the presentation for the sake of time. Mike, please. Okay, very good. So, so I want to just go through a bit of an example, a team management example with policies, checklists, and Kanban board. So, so I'm just going to give you, a, you know, a, a kind of a rough step-by-step -step approach. Uh, if you wanted to go out and try this on your own, you know, saying that, you know, today or in the next few days, just to give, give you, you know, a kind of sketch of how it might work. And so that's what these next steps are. So, so for example, if you want to create an issues only GitHub repo, you go to your GitHub. If you don't have one, create a GitHub account. For example, this is mine, M.A. Haru, uh, without the X. Um, uh, and then you can create a new repository, you know, select new, give it a name, for example, call it issues. Basically, what this, this slide is showing you is a process for creating a, a GitHub repository. Um, I, I actually like having an issues only repo where I'm actually not putting a lot of content in terms of files because then it allows me to create a kind of project-wide view of activities. Now, if there is a specific task that's related to a specific repository that's, you know, a, a, a code that I'm working on, you know, for example, Trilinos, uh, you know, I, I put it into the Trilinos issues database, the one that's part of that repository. But when it comes to broader collections of issues, I showed you some like the initiation checklist. That doesn't belong in a, in a, in a software repository. So I create, I create this issues date, uh, uh, repo and really I, I use it only for managing issues. I may put my team policy in there, maybe a few other things, but, but it's really a, a, an attempt to focus on, uh, having project wide issues that don't belong to any specific software product. And then step two, I, I, I define a team policy. You know, I go into this new repo, the issues repository. I select code and I create this file. I, I'm using Markdown, uh, which I think a lot of people find intuitive as a way of providing uh, structured text. Uh, there certainly, again, are other ways to do it. Um, but but a, a markdown is very simple to learn, and you can create things like tables and and uh, bulleted lists and you know uh, enumerated lists and such uh, very easily. And there you know the syntax is very simple to learn. Um, and so uh, when you define your team policy, what thing, basic questions I think are worth trying to address are you know how do I like to think about a project team as a community. Each person is coming to this community and they want to participate. And so the questions to ask are, how do members of the team support the team? In other words, how does, uh, you know, I, I have a home in a, in a town. What's expected of me as a member of this community? You know, I'm supposed to put my trash out on this particular day. I'm supposed to keep my lawn looking somewhat nice and my house, you know, painted re reasonably nicely. And then another question to ask is how do how does the team support its members? What does the team make as a commitment to the team members? You know that, that the community promises to pick up the trash that you put out on the curb once a week and those kinds of things. This is kind of a fundamental, I think, fruitful way to try to evoke what kinds of things would go into uh, the research team policy statement. And I think the policy has to be a living document. You want to revisit it from time to time. Um, 
and you want to take good practices and, you know, and add them and try to work them. And also, if, if you have a crisis on your team, one of the things you should try to do from that crisis is learn how to inc write into your policy statement something that would reduce the risk of that same crisis occurring in the future. So this should be a living document that your team creates. Uh, then the third, step 3A, is to create issues. So uh, you go in, you create a new issue, um, and then you can submit the issue and, and so on and repeat. 3B, you know, for, here's how you would do create an initiation checklist. Again, just to give you something very concrete. Um, uh, so you create an issue, uh, give it a team, you know, for a particular team member, call it that uh, person's initiation checklist. And then add checklist items. And again, with GitHub, if you use the notation of the hyphen and then the square bracket and a description, it actually creates a little checkbox item uh, on the on the web page. And so you can just uh, check, you know, click on that with your mouse, and it checks as being done. And so it's a very nice visceral kind of way to see progress and feel that you're making progress. And then step four is to create the Kanban board by going to the project tab. You'll click on new project, add a title to that uh, project, and then um, add the columns that we talked about. And then uh, you can add any issue. So for example, the initiation checklist that we talked about right here, you can add that to the Kanban board. And probably you put it right in progress because it's probably the first thing that a new team member is going to take on. But you can then, and then use this Kanban board to manage you know, meetings and see the status of the project at any given time, as long as you're disciplined about updating the status of the issue. Okay, so a bit of a wrap up. Um, so what are some next steps? Um, again, I focused on GitHub as the one I know best. GitLab is certainly useful. Bitbucket and, and Atlassian tools. Um, you know, I, there are many ways to do this, so I don't wanna say that GitHub is the way to do it. Why I like GitHub, even though it has some real you know, known impediments, one is that you can't have unlimited private repositories without paying the money. Uh, the why I like it is that it has the community mind share. Um, I can work, I can bring in new people, students, summer students, and they all have a GitHub account. And so I don't, you know, the training barrier is really low as a result. Um, anyway, so we can, you know, discuss if that's a good thing or not, but anyway, some organization, create an organization. Um, and then for each team member, have them have an individual repo. If they're a grad student or a student or a postdoc, they should have their individual work in that. That includes things like annotated bibliographies of the papers they've read. Uh, if they're writing a thesis, it should be in there, right? And so that when they leave, that you have all that information so it doesn't disappear when they disappear. Um, you want to track all work. And again, this is building up a discipline. This is not something that you're going to you know, be able to do overnight. Uh, be patient with yourself, you know, and your team. You know, when you, when you fall down, you know, get up again and, and keep going. Um, drive your meetings using Kanban boards. This is one of the most effective things I have adapted to in the last six months. As I run all, I run all my regular meetings using a Kanban board. It's incredibly efficient. And then adapt this approach to meet your needs. Again, I'm a carpenter, you're carpenters, you might learn from what I'm saying, um, but you know, do it your own way as you see best. And share with me, I want to know if you don't mind things that work for you. And then as I said, when you start to get sloppy, get back on track. Okay, here are some other resources. Um, I love the book called The Agile Samurai. It's, it's, it's a fun read. Um, I also like to listen to books on Audible. So. So if you want to just listen to it, I've listened to it actually a couple times just to kind of reabsorb um, what's being stated there. I find it an excellent readable book. Um, Code Complete, I mentioned already, the Constructs website. I, I found a lot of valuable information in Steve McConnell's content. The Scrum Alliance I mentioned is Everything Scrum. It's a great portal for getting started. And then the Kanban and Scrum is a very simple, easy to read intro to both of them. And I, I recommend a quick read of that. And it's free. You can just grab it off the internet. Okay, now I'll stop. I'm done. And I'll take any questions or comments. So, Mike, okay, thank you. Should we go back to the list of questions here? As I said before, we have a bunch of them. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so I think it goes back to slide uh, 21, perhaps, this one. 
So okay. if, you are, if your workload comprises a mix of long-term development and quick, urgent issues, uh, say user, user support, how do you manage those urgent issues if they conflict with the number of tasks you have in your ongoing column? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, okay, so, so if, you, if you're in a blended situation where you're not necessarily doing just development, but you also have a support role, I would suggest that you have two independent uh, Kanban boards. Uh, one for the urgent things and one for the longer term things. Uh, and, and, and then you, would, you try to set a target of roughly how much of your resources, pr primarily time, but people as well, you know, to each of those activities. And so that allows you then to try to manage how much time goes into supporting urgent things versus important but non-urgent things. And so that, that would be my advice for that kind of, and mingling them into the same uh, board, it's probably not so easy. Although you could in, in principle perhaps create a, a column in your Kanban board called urgent and try to manage those things. In fact, it, it may be a way for you then to see them in the bigger context. So I, you know, I would try to experiment with those, but certainly I think keeping uh, long-term important but non-urgent activities um, in, a, in some way separated from the urgent thing is a good is a really good thing to do okay so there was one question that came through the question and answer here Q, Q and a so done means the developer completed the task or is it completely done uh, I mean released uh, to production yeah 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 well, the, the philosophy of agile methodology is you don't put something in the done column until it's what they call done done, meaning that it's actually really ready to be released. This is a, a fundamental principle of agile methodologies that you don't get to count something that's 99% done as done. It actually has to be done done. In other words, it's in the, it's in the branch of the repository that's going, that is visible to the users and, and is, or is going out in the next release. You really can't call it done until that is done. Um, it's like building a bridge. A bridge that's 99% done is still a useless bridge because you still fall off into the river down below. Uh, all right, so let me... So, so which work well with the GitHub and other software systems? Uh, which workflows? Uh, I think that's what it is, yes. Yeah, you can get GitHub and, and GitLab and, um, you know, other JIRA, you know, to work well with any of these workflows. They all are pretty supportive. Uh, the, the GitHub one, the GitHub project is actually fairly manual. Uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you work with JIRA, uh, you can automate the organization of your issues into a Kanban board simply by the labels that you apply um, you know, the status uh, markers of the issues that themselves as then they're self, uh, cat, cla self classified and put into the appropriate columns. GitHub is much more manual with their project board, but in a certain way, I don't mind that. I use the GitHub project uh, tab uh, to manage a small scope of work. So I'm not trying to use it, you know, at any given time, there are roughly 500 open issues for the Trilinos project. I'm not trying to manage all of those on one Kanban board. I'm taking a subset of the issues and then managing those um, through, through GitHub's project. So, it's, so uh, you know, GitHub is small scale, manual. Jira is, can, is, can be small scale as well, but it also can be large scale. And, and I, I think you know, a more sophisticated approach, but it's also a little bit a more complicated tool. So, okay, Mike, it's past 11. Uh, should we answer some more, few more questions here or just uh, answer them uh, through the um, Google Doc? Yeah, I, I have time, uh, whatever people want. Uh, so. Okay, so let me um, go here. Uh, you, people can drop off if, if, they, if they need to do something else, but I, I'm willing to stick around. So I think that's also slide 26. The question was if that was a Kanban border trail. 
Uh, 20, on slide 26, this is a project board from GitHub. So if you were go to go to uh, GitHub, uh, go to a particular repository, you'll see across the top on the main page a projects tab. And, and in this particular case, there's one project and, and we're looking at the columns associated with that project. Yes, actually, I think some of the participants had already answered that question. But okay. really related to this, is this something that, uh, okay, so this is GitHub, but is there anything similar to that in Bitbucket that you are aware of? I, I am not familiar with Bitbucket. I apologize. I don't, I don't have enough experience with Bitbucket. Maybe somebody else does who can answer in the chat or in the Google Doc. So what do you do if you are on multiple teams, each with their own Kanban board? How can you give all teams the ability to see your total tasking? Well, you have, they have to be able to, every Kanban board that I've worked with has a URL. And so if you want uh, your team to be able to see each of them, they need to be able to click on that URL, URL and get access to it. So they have to have permission. If they don't have permission to see it, then, then I, I don't know what else to do. So, uh, so that's, I think, key. Then you can ask, well, can they see and change? That, that can be a different choice, right? Um, you know, for example, anybody can uh, go out and see my, you know, the Trilinos Kanban board. Uh, we have one for some of our key customers that we use to manage those. Anybody can see that, but only team members can actually modify it. So, Mike, is it helpful for each team member to have their own board? Um, I, I think that, I think it, yes. I think the answer is yes, in a, because in a certain way, the personal board is the only way that you can get a sense of each person's uh, total uh, numbers of items in progress, uh, right? And, and, you know, you, if, you're, if a person has, an, you know, an item that's in the in progress column, you know, for a project, the question is, well, how much of their total time can be assigned in this project? And so you have to negotiate, well, how many uh, work in progress or in progress items can any individual team member have? And, and so one way to know that is to be able to look at, for that person to look at their personal Kanban board and, and see all of the activities that they have going on across all their projects. And so I, I don't know, myself, I think that's a useful activity. I have not found a tool that automatically connects and maps the individual, an individual Kanban board where all of their items across, you know, so one person works on three projects. So can you automatically map all of their items from their personal Kanban board into the appropriate project for projects one, two, and three? I have not seen a tool that does that. Uh, and, and, and I'm not sure that I'd want one you know, at this point, at least for me, right? Um, but the, if you find a tool, I'd actually be interested in knowing about it. So Mike, I think uh, uh, we are gonna answer the remaining questions through the Google Doc. So, okay. Okay, very good. So I'll just take the opportunity here to announce, to thank you very much, Mike, and to thank you everybody for participating. And uh, uh, so again, so this is the link, the Google Doc, where all the questions are going to be answered. And also the links where there is slides and the recording will be available. I take the opportunity to announce the next webinar in about a month. Managing the facts in HPC software development that will be uh, given by uh, Thomas Evans from uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again, Mike. Thank you very much for, for joining us today and see you in a month. Yeah. Good day. Bye bye.